Eh, muy buenas tardes a todos y a todas las asistentes. Para mí es un privilegio presentar a Wayne okay. Holmes, tiene un PhD en la Universidad de Oxford y es profesor asociado en el UCA Knowledge Lab en la University College de Londres y habiendo estado involucrado en la educación a lo largo de toda su vida, Wayne aporta una perspectiva crítica de la enseñanza y aplicación de la inteligencia artificial en contextos educativos y sus implicaciones éticas, humanas y de justicia social. Wayne ha asesorado a los Ministerios de Educación de Portugal y del Reino Unido y actualmente dirige el proyecto Artificial Intelligence and Education, a Critical View Through the Lens of Human Rights, Democracy and the Rule of Law, que elaboró un instrumento legal para los Estados miembros del Consejo Europeo. También es consultor de la Technology and AI in Education Unit en UNESCO, para la cual escribió el texto AI and Education Guidance for Policymakers y es investigador senior en el International Research Center on Artificial Intelligence de la UNESCO. Después de haber enseñado en la Universidad de Oxford, la Universidad de Bristol y la Open University, Wayne actualmente imparte clases en la maestría en Educación y Tecnología en el University College of London, donde coordina el módulo de Investigación del Aprendizaje Digital e imparte clases en el módulo Debates y Cuestiones Clave. También es profesor asociado adjunto de la Universidad de Nova Gorica, una de las universidades privadas más importantes de Eslovenia, donde imparte el módulo de Tecnologías Avanzadas para la Educación de la Maestría en Liderazgo en Educación Abierta. Entre sus publicaciones recientes se encuentran en coautoría Artificial Intelligence in Education, Promise and Implications for Teaching and Learning, de 2019, Ethics of AI in Education Towards a Community-Wide Framework, en 2021, State of the Art and Practice in AI in Education, en 2022, The Ethics of AI in Education, Practices, Challenges and Debates en 2022, entre otras. El doctor Holmes ha sido invitado a dar conferencias sobre inteligencia artificial y educación en Brasil, en China, Croacia, Dinamarca, Alemania, Grecia, India, Japón, Oman, Eslovenia, España, Estados Unidos y ahora en México, donde nos visita por primera vez y nos ofrecerá la conferencia magistral The Ethics of AI in Education, Practices, Challenges and Debates. Démosle una cordial bienvenida al doctor Wayne Holmes. Thank you very much. Um, well, hello everybody. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm really pleased to see you all because we've just had lunch and I know you would probably all prefer to go and have a little sleep rather than be here. But anyway, um, I, I'm very grateful that you have chosen to be here. Um, to start with, um, what I wanted to do was to say thank you to the team and, and Ibero and everybody for the invitation for me to join you today. It's, um, it's a huge privilege and this is my first visit to, to Mexico and I've loved every moment I've had so far. Um, so I just wanted to um, mention a couple of things about work that's ongoing, just to give you a context. So um, work for um, UNESCO, and on the left there is a document that I co-wrote on uh, guidance for policymakers about AI and education, and on the right is a publication all about generative AI. We've already heard a bit about that today, and we're going to hear a little bit more as well, and that's going to be published hopefully next week. Um, for the Council of Europe, for those of you that know the Council of Europe, it's, it's not the European Union that you've probably heard of. It's the Human Rights Organization of Europe. Um, it combines uh, 46 countries. And the reason I'm just um, hesitating with this is because we're developing um, some regulation. So if this regulation is agreed by the Council, this will go to all of the countries um, across Europe and beyond. So this, for me, is a very exciting piece of work. Um, moving on then, so what I want to do, we're talking about um, artificial intelligence and with artificial intelligence we've heard today about some of the amazing things that artificial intelligence does. 
right? So I'm not going to spend any time talking about the amazing things that artificial intelligence does. Instead, I'm going to try and burst the bubble a bit because I'm interested in what are the problems. Um, so the first thing that we must recognize is that when we look at AI, and when we look at what AI is doing, um, AI is just uh, working upon a model of the real world. And just like that little car model there, it's a very rough representation of the real world. And because of that, it's never going to be quite right. And that often gets forgotten. Um, and here's one example of the ways in which these things um, are not quite right. So some of you might have seen this, but anyway, um, can you all tell me, what can you see on the screen? You're all humans, so what can you see on the screen? Thank you very much. And the cool thing is that the AI system that was trained to recognize this um, agreed with 57.7% confidence. So far, so good. But what happens when that image of the panda is mixed together with this noise, this visual noise? Well, we end up with this. So I ask you as humans, what do you see? Thank you. And this time, the AI is 99.3% confident, which is kind of cool, right? But it's confident that it's a given. <laughs> so AI is impressive, but it's not necessarily as impressive as we think. Here's another example um, from autonomous cars. Now, we see that as a stop sign. We see both of them as stop sign. If you were driving and you saw this, you would stop. Well, on the right-hand one, the little white and black rectangles, that's been stuck on there. And the AA, the cars, the autonomous cars, now do not recognize this as a stop sign. So in other words, AI is also brittle. The stop sign was from a few years ago, but this was from last week. This is an autonomous car in San Francisco. And all you have to do is to put one of those orange cones on the bonnet of the car, and it stops completely. Nothing happens. Now, if you were driving and somebody put an orange cone in your car, well, you might have something to say, but you certainly wouldn't give up. So these tools look impressive, but often they're not. Here's another one. Um, there was a bunch of uh, chatbots that were created by these companies and were released onto the internet. And very quickly, the American one started spewing racist and sexist comments. The Chinese one um, started defaming people. Uh, the, the, the Japanese one, well, we'll go from there. Well, the Korean one started making offensive comments. Now, these were tools, these were AI that were just put out there, and this is what happened. Um, I like this, because this kind of explains one of the ways in which AI works. So here the baby's being shown, there's daddy. And so, of course, what the baby then says, there's daddy. <laughs> there's daddy. Oops and there's daddy. <laughs> um, but it's a cartoon, but the way it's describing is exactly how it works, and it's important for this kind of reason. So this was from a research paper, came out of China, but before you think, okay, it's the Chinese, uh, a similar work came out of Stanford um, very recently, um, but this was looking at criminality, and they trained their system with thousands of pictures of criminals, and thousands of pictures of non-criminals. And they said in their report that the system can now detect criminals from non-criminals. This wasn't true. What can you see about the difference in those pictures? The non-criminals all got white shirts on and wearing suits. So all the AI system was detecting was those who were wearing suits and those who weren't wearing suits. So it's very dangerous to make assumptions about the way this works. Um, the Stanford project that I mentioned, and um, there they're arguing that they can use their system to reliably detect someone's sexuality from a picture of their face. Again, this has been criticized really quite heavily. Um, here's another example. This was Amazon 
recognition, a facial recognition system. Um, if you're like me, you've got a white skin, you're a male, the system's pretty accurate. Um, if you're a darker skin male, uh, not quite so good. Um, a lighter skin female, even worse. And a darker skin female, really quite appalling. Now, you could say, well, look, this is just early days. And that given a bit of time, and these tools are going to get better. Maybe that's true, but it actually still begs the question, do you really want to be recognized just when you walk down the street doing your private business, when you walk into a shop, when you go to the cinema, when you go to the bank? Do you want to be facially recognized? Well, that's what these systems are looking at, and we saw an example of that from the previous speaker. Um, Here's the reason why we should really think about these systems. Um, so what happened here is they got this picture, heavily pixelated picture, and they used AI to correct the pixelation. So who do we see? No, you're completely wrong. <laughs> this is what the AI came up with. Now, this was a couple of years ago, but this one is very recent. So a young woman, she decided she wanted to improve her appearance for her LinkedIn or Instagram profile. And so she used generative AI to help with this process. And this is what it did. Now, I don't know if you, but I think that is just profoundly offensive. Um, one of the myths we have about AI, and again, we've heard a little bit about this earlier today, is the relationship between AI and humans. Now, I would argue that AI does not exist without humans. So without a human setting the objective, nothing happens. Without a human choosing and cleaning the data, nothing happens. Without a human labeling the data, nothing happens. And the picture you can see on the right there, um, these are essentially factories in countries like Kenya, but also in Eastern Europe, where the job of these people is to sit there day in, day out, looking at image after image after image from a video. And they, there's a person, there's a car, there's a person. Next frame, there's the car, there's the person, there's the car. Next frame, and they do that day in and day out. And without that, lots of the systems that we take for granted, they just wouldn't work. So the notion that these systems work without humans, I think, is laughable. Also, a human designs a network. A human trains the network. A human curates the outputs. And most importantly, a human makes the value judgments. So without a human, these systems do not work. They do not exist. And the other side of this is we shouldn't be getting angry, necessarily, at the AI system. We should be thinking about the humans behind the AI system. Um, in the pandemic, everybody said, this is great. This is going to be the time when AI is going to bloom. AI is going to do something amazing here. But as it says here in this meta-analysis, of these 2,000 plus studies, none of them were of use in a clinical setting. None of them. And this was one meta-analysis, there were many like this. So it was the time for AI to shine, it didn't happen. And it's interesting that organizations like IBM, they have shut down their AI medical department. They're not investing money in it anymore. Um, and this comes back to you know, these, these big organizations that are developing um, these tools. But what it means is we're effectively giving over to these companies um, the rights and the strengths and the responsibility to do what they like. And we need to be very careful about this because these big companies, you know, we do not have any democratic control over any of them. And particularly for a country like Mexico, when, you know, there isn't a Mexican company up there, right? It's companies from the US. It's companies from China. And we need to be very careful about this. And you might have seen this guy a few months ago, Jeffrey Hinton. 
Um, he's one of the three people known as the godfathers of AI. And he worked for Google for many years. He made a fortune, a personal fortune, from working for Google. Fair enough. But then he retired from Google, and the next day he was saying, oh my God, AI is going to destroy the world. You know, what he'd been developing for 30 years. We have another person who used to work for Google. Now, Tim Gebru is a researcher, and she published a paper that was critical of a small piece of work that Google were doing in the space of AI. And so what did they do? They forced her out. Now, she now runs a, a really important NGO, but it's interesting how we have these different things. But what's particularly interesting about Tim and her colleagues is that she's pointing out, look, why are we talking about this future that may or may not happen? We need to be thinking about the ways in which AI today is impacting negatively on so many people, is discriminating against people, is putting people back in prison, is, is um, accusing people of crimes they did not commit. So we need to think about the problems today, not worry just about the problems in the future. Okay, so that was my attempt to burst the bubble on AI. I'm now going to talk about AI in education, and the reason being, that's my field. I'm interested in the ways in which AI um, is being used um, in education. So, to start with, we have to recognize that the connections between AI and education are actually quite complex. And so for people like me, I like to simplify it. So I simplify it in terms of two buckets. And the first bucket is teaching and learning with AI. And the second bucket is teaching and learning about AI. So these two are definitely separate, but they definitely overlap. And it's important we think about them separately. So I'm going to talk about teaching and learning with AI. So teaching and learning with AI can be further subdivided into AI that focuses on the student, AI that focuses on the teacher, and AI that focuses on the institution. And the AI ed there is AI in education. It's the, the shorthand that's used. So um, let's look at it. I'm going to start with institution-focused AI. And here's just some examples of the way that AI is being used at an institutional level. And this is actually not received a huge amount of research, but it's, I think, going to be the type of AI in education that's going to grow massively in the near future. And if you think about it, it's a bit like during the, um, you know, thing like the Californian gold rush, when it wasn't the people who were digging for gold who became rich, it was the people who made the jeans and the people who ran the bars and the hotels who became rich. And I think this could be the same here. But then we have student-focused. And these are the kind of categories, these are the types um, that you might think of. Um, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time talking about them all, but the key point here is that there are many different types. And so we can't think about AI ed as being one thing. It's multiple different things. And when we need to think about any one particular one, that doesn't mean to say that we can apply it across. We need to be quite careful. So here's an example. They're called intelligent tutoring systems. And this is probably the thing that most people think of when they think of AI in education. Now, I immediately have a problem with this. I'm going to come back to this again and again. <clears throat> the one thing these systems are is they're not intelligent. Okay? So it's a misnomer to call them intelligent. I prefer to call them adaptive tutoring systems, but there's an entire research community that's all about ITSs. The way these things work is the child engages with the system, it gives them some information, an activity, a quiz, and then depending on what the student does, that changes the next piece of information, the next activity, the next quiz. And so each individual student does their own pathway through the materials to be learned, theoretically. And the list on the right are all multi-million dollar funded companies from around the world um, that are, um, have these kind of products and have the voice of policy makers, sorry, the ear of policy makers. This one's quite different. I like this one a lot. It actually comes from China, from Beijing Normal University. Um, and it's 
with this one, um, when a student is in a class and they get confused about something and they come out of the class, they think, I, I want to find out about this. Well, they pull out their app, they put the topic into the app, and it works like a dating device. It connects them with human tutors. And then they get 20 minutes of one-to-one -one tuition with a human tutor. So the AI's function is to make the connections and to manage the whole system. But it, instead of the, the previous one I showed you, the system decides what the student needs to know next. With this, the student decides what they wish to know next. So that's why I prefer this quite a lot. Um, AI-assisted apps, a um, whole range of different things, things like Photomath, uh, things like Wolfram Alpha, and one I learned only two days ago from my new friend Lewis over there, um, Scaniverse, which allows you to turn uh, an object quickly using your mobile phone into a 3D model that you can then interact with and use in different ways. So a whole bunch, and there are thousands of apps um, that, that, that are available that are using AI in one way or another. Um, there's also the chatbots. Lots of universities are setting up chatbots these days so that students can get information about where do I find this, where's my next exam, where's the book, what's the time that my lesson's happening um, by going to the chatbot. And then AI-assisted simulations. So using the kind of models I showed you earlier, but ways in which using VR goggles, whatever, the student can engage with the materials. So, as I say, you know, this is a pretty wide range of different types of tools, which is why we need to be careful when we make big judgments about one or the other. So what about the last category, then, teacher-focused? Now, this one is still the one that has the least research on it. Most of what I've shown you is all about how do we do, how do we automate something that the teacher does? Whereas what we're talking about here is how do we make tools um, that actually help teachers to do what teachers want to do. Um, so I'll give you some examples here. Uh, this one is from IBM, but the idea of using uh, AI to find resources. So you type in a topic, I want to teach this topic, and boom, it gives you a list of resources. Uh, the X5 gone on the list there does that for open education resources. So, you know, potentially this could be really interesting, but these tools are very primitive at the moment, don't really do a fantastic job. Um, this one is um, about assessment, but what I like about this is it's not the AI system doing the assessment. It's a tool that uses AI to help the teacher to do the assessment as they choose to do it. So you see the big difference I'm making here between on the one hand, the student focus is all about replacing the teacher. On the other hand, the teacher focus is all about supporting the teacher. So, that's some examples, a whirlwind tour of how AI is being used in education, AI ed. So now I want to burst that bubble as well and think about what that brings to mind. So, the first thing is, we're, hard, we're told all the time that these systems are intelligence. And to be fair, it is called artificial intelligence. But I want to say now, and make this absolutely clear, there is no AI system today of any kind whatsoever that deserves the word intelligent. They are not intelligent. Okay? Full stop. I would argue, so the cows come home, on that one. Now, the reality is that sometimes they can appear intelligent, but there's a big difference between appearing intelligent and actually being intelligent. And I love this as an example. This is from the 18th century. So this is an automaton, a, a robot that was developed and that toured the courts of, of, um, of Europe. And the automaton could play chess. And so the, 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 the emperors and the noblemen would come and play chess against the machine. It was amazing. The machine would beat them. That was the appearance. Here's the reality. Inside the machine, there was a real human, a skilled chess player, and quite a little one by the looks of it, but nevertheless, um, a skilled chess player, and that's how um, that was won. So that big difference between something that appears intelligent 
and something that is intelligent. We mustn't confuse the two, in my opinion. Okay, another thing that we're told about these tools is that they save teacher time. Here all the time, the, the, the Department for Education that, uh, in the UK, they've spent years arguing this and paying good money to get it proven. Well, the whole concept of proving, uh, saving teacher time was first um, argued for by a person you might have heard of called B.F. Skinner, the behaviorist, the psychologist. In the 1930s, he developed a machine that he called the teaching machine. And his, one of his key selling points of the teaching machine is it will save teacher time. We've had almost 100 years since then with hundreds of technologies developed. And how many of them really do save teacher time? What they do is they displace teacher time. So instead of doing this, they do that. So we need to be very careful about this. And even if they do save teacher time, which they don't, but if they did, then doesn't it mean we're just going to get rid of teachers? Because we don't need them anymore. We save 10% of teacher time, we can get rid of 10% of teachers. So this is why policymakers like this idea of saving teacher time. They're not really interested in saving teacher time. They're interested in saving money. The other one that comes up all the time is personalization. And again, B.F. Skinner, he argued that his teaching machine personalised the learning for each individual student. And those intelligent tutoring systems I mentioned, the adaptive tutoring systems, that's what they all do, apparently. They personalise. But actually, they only personalise in a very limited way. They only personalise the pathways. They don't personalise the outcomes. Now, I was at a conference a CEO of a big, one of those big companies I mentioned, and he came up with a metaphor. <clears throat> he said that an ordinary school is like all the students being on a school bus, you know, the big yellow bus. They're all going at the same speed, the same direction, the same, um, you know, doing it all the same. Same destination. He said, but my company, what we're providing is an Uber taxi for every individual student. But I don't think he took the metaphor far enough. Hands up among you who get an Uber taxi because it takes you on an interesting route. Or do you get an Uber taxi because it takes you to where you want to go? The problem is that all those ITSs they might take people on those individual pathways, but their whole purpose is to take students to the same place, to take them all to the bus station. That's not personalization. For me, real personalization is about helping individual students to become the best that they personally can become, to self-actualize, so that they can contribute to society the most for themselves. That's real personalization. These tools don't do that. Instead, what they do is they work towards putting everybody in the same box. And words like efficiency comes to play a lot. And one of the other things that annoys me about this whole personalization thing is the suggestion um, from Silicon Valley, of course. This is where it all comes from, Silicon Valley. But the suggestion that the only way we can personalize learning is through this technology. But actually, those of you who are involved in education, whether you're a student or a teacher, you know that that's what teachers do moment by moment in the classroom. They personalize. So to suggest that the only way we can personalize is through technology, and then not to personalize, I think is a, is, is a huge um, problem. It also forgets, this personalization, that education and learning is about collaboration, it's about working. It's about the social aspects of teaching and learning. And it also, these tools, um, it represents commercialization by stealth. So in other words, in most countries, education's for the common good. It's a social thing. We develop it as, company, as countries together. We pay for it through our taxes. It's for the social good. But increasingly with these companies, eking their way um, into, um, into the 
uh, the, the, the classroom, it means that we're slowly but surely we're commercializing uh, teaching and learning, which I think is a huge problem. The reason for the picture on the left is sat-navs. Now, those of you who use sat-navs, own up, you now find it challenging to navigate your way around the town without a sat-nav. We get used to it. We get dependent upon it. So the question we need to ask is if we introduce these technologies into classrooms, will our students get over-reliant on it, dependent upon it, in ways that we can't know? Now, I'm not saying they would. I'm saying we don't know and that we definitely need more research. The other thing that they claim to be able to do in some of these tools is emotion detection. Now, the ambition is to say, well, look, if a student's in a bad emotional state, they're not going to learn. So if we can identify they're in a bad emotional state and we can move them into a good emotional state, then we're going to make them more prepared for learning. Well, there are two problems with that. Firstly, the technologies don't work. They cannot detect emotion. And secondly, for me, it's another huge, or it's a final frontier of privacy invasion. Now we're pretending we can look inside the heads of our students to actually what they're thinking. I think this, again, is hugely problematic. Um, so is this, attention monitoring classrooms. This is happening a lot. Now, again, you think, well, this is China. It's going to happen, right? And actually, in China, they banned this technology something like three years ago. And in any case, the technology that's being used here was developed in the USA. And it is being used in many places. And one way it's being used, and it might have been used here, I don't know, was in e-proctoring. But the problem with e-proctoring is it's invasive. It can undermine confidence, mental health problems, huge range of different things. Most importantly, it doesn't even do what they claim to do. Any smart student can spend half an hour of their time working a way to get around these technologies to make sure they're not cheating. So they don't even do the job. But it looks like they do the job. So that's why they get all the money. The other problem is things like human rights. And it occurs to me, you know, a lot of um, issues with these things, we need to think very carefully about the ways in which um, human rights are being compromised. Um, so things like, um, I have to look it up because there are too many human rights for me to remember them all and make sure I don't forget any. So apologies for that. But anyway, human rights, uh, the UN and uh, other organisations, we've all signed up to them, all the countries. So the human right to dignity, to autonomy, to be heard, to not suffer from discrimination, to privacy, and to be protected from economic exploitation. Now, all the stuff I've just told you, are compromising a ton of that. But we don't seem to worry about it. Because it's efficient, apparently. Okay, now, you might think that everything I've just told you is me having a moan, and I don't, can't really justify any of it, right? I'm just being extreme and silly about this. The point is that for all those technologies I've shown you, there is almost no independent evidence at scale for either the efficacy of these tools or the safety of these tools. Now, there's a thousand research papers about such things, but they're always small, they're always controlled by the developer or the researcher, um, and they're, they're, you know, they're very localized. But there is nothing at scale. So before we start using these in classrooms, what, I, I don't think it's too much to ask that we actually know that this stuff works and that we know that it's safe. Because if you take the logic of all these tools, then this is the next step. When a child is born, we just shoot them in the head with a chip, a computer chip. And on that computer chip, we have all of Wikipedia. We have all the knowledge in the world on that chip. That's it. We don't need education anymore because they've got all the knowledge. Obviously, I don't believe that. But the thing you do need to know is that companies such as by Elon Musk are developing such chips as we speak. So this is not as scientific fiction as you might think. 
One of the reasons I think there are all these problems is because typically what happens with the developers and the researchers, they start with what they know. They start with the AI, and then they look around to find problems. And I think this is round the wrong way. Now, don't get too excited, but there's a bit of animation coming up here. If it works. Oops, it went too quickly. Oh, God. There you go. OK, so I think we should start with the problem. That's the key. We need to start with the problem. And who are the experts on the problems in education? Well, the experts are people like you, educators, students, people actually engaged in education. They're the people who should be defining the problems, not computer scientists. Some of my best friends are computer scientists, but they just make these slight mistakes, in my opinion. Here's another way of thinking about the same thing. What typically happens when you start with the technology is you look for the problem. And here's a problem. Children not receiving the education they deserve. This is an important problem. And actually, when you think about it, this is actually just the symptom. And the real problem is what below, is the causes. A lack of qualified teachers, perhaps, and the poor pedagogic practices. And what happens, though, is our technologist um, colleagues, they target the symptoms and they don't even think about the causes. And that's a real problem. Here's another example of that. What is the problem here? The problem was, and this is in the UK, the children were getting their dinner and then queuing up for 5, 10, 15 minutes to pay. So how do we solve that? We solve it with facial recognition. So just the child just walks past the camera and their account is debited automatically. Fantastic, we've solved the problem. Well, I think that's outrageous. I do not think we should be having facial recognition. This is really happening in schools in the UK. I'm not making this up. Instead of that, we should be thinking, what are the causes? Now, what's the real problem here? The real problem here is that we want our children to have a proper lunch. We want them to be properly fed in the school day. Well, an easy social solution to that it doesn't involve technology. It means we just make the food free. Then they don't have to queue up to pay. It's really simple, but that's a social decision, not a technology decision. OK, so that's thinking about AI in general. And now I'm going to narrow down a bit and think about um, the ethics of AI in education. Um, Whenever we talk about the ethics of AI, the focus inevitably is on the data. Right? All conversations, you look up any, any reference to the ethics of AI, it's the focus on the data, the ethics of the data. And there's very little um, that goes beyond that. But the point about AI is that AI doesn't exist in the cloud independent of the world. It's always applied. So AI is applied to transport, AI is applied to healthcare, AI is applied to cities, or AI is applied to education. So what we also need to be taking into account, and there's our old friend Skinner, um, is the ethics of education, the ethics of pedagogy. And we can't separate those two apart. But it often is. Now, um, what do we mean by being ethical? Now, a real problem about being ethical is trying to get that baseline, a baseline that we all agree with. And so we argue, well, look, we're doing, being ethical is about aligning with human values. And there's a whole research field in computer science that's all about aligning AI with human values. It's called the alignment problem. But the real problem is, whose human values? Whose human values do we want to align with? We need to be cleverer than that. So one of the ways we might think to do it is to use the human rights that I mentioned earlier, the child rights, as our starting point. And so when we're thinking about is this technology ethical, we need to think about those different um, human rights. So I mentioned these earlier, so to dignity, autonomy, to be heard. to not suffer from discrimination, to privacy, and to be protected from economic exploitation. So that's been signed up to 
by most countries of the world. So that gives us a baseline that maybe we need to be thinking about. And again, I ask you to reflect of all the technologies I've told you about and the others we've heard, which of them start to compromise this? And I would argue that many of them do. The other thing I want to talk about in ethics is, you know, ethics is obviously complicated. And I like to make a distinction, which might be difficult in terms of language, but I'm sure it makes sense, um, between doing things ethically and doing ethical things. A subtle distinction, let me explain. So remember the e-proctoring systems I talked about, the monitoring to stop people cheating in exams. Well, I've no doubt that when the people develop those tools, they work hard to make sure that they are ethical. So they worry about privacy, transparency, all these different things. It ticks all those boxes. But for me, that's only doing things ethically. And we need to step outside that bubble to think about, are we actually doing ethical things? So what about all this? What about the impact of these tools on, on mental health? Or what about the notion of surveillance? What about intrusion, accountability, fairness, unintended consequences, bias? So a whole range of different things. But if we only focus on making sure the tool is developed in an ethical way, then all those things outside can get forgotten. I, um, for the AI Ed conference um, last year, I was the chair of a session on the ethics of AI and Ed, and um, somebody did come on and talk about e-proctoring, and, and they were talking about all the stuff inside. And I then said, well, what about these other things? And they had no answers. Because e-proctoring is, you know, some universities tick, it's what we have to do. But, you know, e-proctoring systems are obviously challenging, but what about the intelligent tutoring systems I mentioned earlier? Now, again, all those things inside, they tick all those boxes. They, they, they tick those boxes, but we have to think about the bubble again and think about what about the things outside. So a whole range of different things that we really need to consider if we're going to make sure that the tools that we're going to put into classrooms are genuinely ethical. I'm sure there's one more. There you go. One more. There we go. So, a whole bunch of different things there that we also need to be thinking about. So, it's not just about making the technology though, it's self ethical, it's about stepping back and seeing the bigger picture and thinking about it rather more carefully. So, that was teaching and learning with AI. I'm now going to move on to teaching and learning about AI because I think it's also similarly quite important. So with this, I like to separate it into the human dimension of AI and the technological dimension of AI. So in terms of talking about AI, there's a lot of work going on, and people do, a lot of organizations out there. So AI for K-12 is a US-based organization, but it has people involved you know, around the world. And they look at um, AI from all these different things, and this is the kind of things that they teach. So perception, representation and reasoning, learning, blah, 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 blah. So they have a whole bunch of stuff that they talk about. You'll see in the middle it says societal impact. I'll come back to that later. And then, of course, every university in the world offers some kind of courses on how to develop, how to become an AI engineer, how to do machine learning, how to do data analysis, and all those different things. So, you know, there's a lot of teaching about AI out there. Um, some of you might have seen this. This is from Finland. It's called Elements of AI, and it's free, and you can go on there, and it will help, help you learn about AI. But all of these have a real problem. And the problem is that they only focus on the technological dimension of AI, how AI works and how to create it. And what almost none of them talk about is the human impact of these technologies. And for me, that's, that's missing half of the story. So I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about the technology, but we should also talk about the impact of these technologies on people, on us. And if we don't do that, um, then I think we're making a huge mistake. Um, and 
Some of them, they say they do, but they really don't. So that societal impact, I mean, it's just a tiny bit. Um, so I like to use the metaphor to understand this of a car. So if we're going to drive a car, we need to have some understanding. We need to understand that the car will only move if we put petrol, gas, whatever you call it, into there. Without that, it doesn't do anything. We also need to know about those pedals, and we need to know about the wheel, all that stuff together. Without that, we, don't, we can't use a car. But some people argue that really to understand and use a car properly, you need to have some understanding of how the car works, its mechanics, how the engine works, its carburetor, all those kind of things. That's a different set of stuff that you might need to know about. But hopefully, all of you here would agree that the third thing we need to know about is the health and safety, is the safety, is the rules of the road. How do we protect ourselves when we're driving? How do we protect other users? When do we have to stop? When can we go? All those kind of things, right? We have to know this stuff, right? I mean, I've now been driven around Mexico City a lot. We have to know this stuff, right? Without this, it can become very, very challenging. Okay, so how does this apply to AI? Well, going back to the petrol, I would argue all of us, all of, and I mean all of us, citizens across the world, we need to have an understanding of how this stuff works, what it's about, um, how it's, um, what it can do, the kind of stuff we've heard about earlier today. Some people, those who want to become engineers, need to understand it in more detail, need to understand how it works underneath the bonnet. And maybe for our young people, our children, there's probably some stuff that they should explore with this um, and become um, more familiar with. But most importantly for me is that, is understanding the kind of things that were mentioned by both our earlier speakers today. What is the impact of these tools on humans, on human relationships? What is the impact on our future? All those kind of things. And for me, we need to be thinking about this as well. So in other words, putting that together, we've got the technological dimension, we have the human dimension, and I think in any teaching, it needs to be interwoven. We can't separate them. We can't just talk about one. What typically happens on a course on AI is they spend you know, a 10-hour course, they spend 9 hours and 45 minutes talking about the technology. So, oh, before you go, we must remember to talk about the ethics, and by ethics we mean bias. Well, that's obviously nonsense. We need to be integrating those. So if you're talking about facial recognition, we need to be talking about the technology and the human impact. Not separate them, because they're not separate. Okay. I'm now going to talk about the elephant in the room, which, of course, is ChatGPT. Now, everyone's talked about ChatGPT today, and I am no different. But I might be taking a slightly different approach, as you might have guessed already. So, ChatGPT is an example of generative AI. And we know that ChatGPT does this kind of stuff. I know most of you play with it. Um, but we also have um, a bunch of other companies doing stuff. And this is just the, the, the service. There's, there are many out there doing lots of different things. But we also know that it's used for making images. Now, this is where I perhaps disagree, although obviously I don't have the expertise to disagree with our last speaker. For this image, right, this was created by AI. No, it wasn't. It was created with AI. AI was being used as a tool. And it was all done on the prompts. And to create this image, the person took weeks of writing prompts and rewriting 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 prompts and re you know that was the creative process and this was a tool this was one um, that I thought was particularly amazing so this is a photograph that's been entirely created using an AI tool but one of the things about ChatGPT and all of these things is it all sounds like it's happened in the past few months. Well, this isn't true. So this picture I started showing at least five years ago in my talks. Not one of those faces is a real person. They've all been entirely created using AI tool. But as I say, 
it was probably late when I started talking about it. This is at least five years ago. So the difference we have with the chat GBT and everything that's everyone going ballistic now and going crazy is not because the technology has moved on a huge amount. It's because of two things. The technology was made easily accessible to everyone via the internet. And two, using an easy-to-use interface. That's the only thing that's changed. So this idea that, oh my god, AI is, is, is rapidly developing. I mean, there are some things that are developing, this is true. But it's not suddenly happened in the past few months. And um, lots of the predictions of the way going forward are not that true. So in education, if you do a five-minute Google search, and I recommend you use Google for searching, not ChatGPT, because it doesn't do good searching, um, you will find hundreds of websites now with thousands of ideas of ways in which you can use ChatGPT. I will use ChatGPT to stand in for all the others, right? So ways you can use ChatGPT in the class, and there are thousands of ideas. Um, but there's a huge problem with this. The problem is that ChatGPT looks human-like. You agree? The output looks like it's been written by a human. But it isn't. It looks accurate. But it isn't. It looks intelligent. But it isn't. And it looks as if it understands. It understands my prompt. It understands what it writes. But it doesn't. Now, this is fact. Okay, This is not my opinion. This is fact. These systems do not understand anything. Nothing at all. And the danger is that this is going to... Um, that, that, that gap between the appearance again, as I mentioned earlier, and the reality, is the danger. And where we as educators... Um, we need to think carefully about. And this is what we need to work with our students about. Um, this is the first time I've shown this image, but I do like it. Um, this image represents reality. So all the different colours representing different shades of opinion, different places, different... Uh, human values, whatever you like, right? It's a huge range of different things. And this is what ChatGPT does. So it takes out all of that stuff. So what ChatGPT and the others do is they take essentially the standardized perspective. And by standardized perspective, I usually mean the USA and some of Western Europe. And frankly, you know, Latin America... You're not part of the standardized approach, so you are going to be marginalized more. People in Africa, are going to, their marginalized voice is going to be marginalized more because what these systems will do is further marginalize because it just reproduces the standard opinion. And the non-standard opinion is out. And if you think one of the worries of that is a worry about innovation because innovation, when it starts, is always a marginalized voice. It's always a small voice. But if we continue to use these tools too much, that's going to be um, removed. A couple of other things um, is I've been using ChatGPT. I actually paid money for the GPT-4 version in order to help me write a report. I thought, let's do this properly. I had a report I had to write. I will use ChatGPT and try really hard to use it effectively. I've given up. Because what it generates is so superficial. It makes so many errors. It leaves out so much. That actually, all the time I spent writing different prompts and then rewriting its outputs, it was ridiculous. I actually just focused and done the writing myself. So I'm just not convinced that it's actually any good. And what I say to students, yep, maybe it will help you pass. That's true. Will it help you get a good mark? Will it help you understand the material that you're trying to engage with? Absolutely no way. The other problem with these tools that is often not mentioned is that they are clearly generating a lot of information. And that information is going back onto the internet. And so when there is the next version, the 
GPT-5, it's going to be trained on data that GPT-4 created. And if that process continues, we're going to get sucked into this regressive, I don't know, vortex somewhere. Um, and there are people already talking about the idea of model collapse, where the system will just literally fall apart and won't be able to work. This picture represents the fact that OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, they just launched it. They just said it's out there, you can use it now. If we did that with a car, the person who launched it would be in prison because they've not checked its safety, right? But with OpenAI, apparently it was okay. They could just launch it. And we're all now suffering from it in different ways. But also, I mentioned this to you before, <coughs> these poor workers in places like Kenya being paid $2 an hour to sift through the materials that the original version was spewing out to identify stuff that was objectionable, that was nasty, that was racist, that was sexist, so that they could retune ChatGPT so it stopped doing that. And there are now stories of people who were involved in this work. Their marriage is broken down, they're under the care of a doctor because they have mental health issues. None of that worries OpenAI and the millionaires who run it. But I think, you know, when we're thinking about the ethics of these tools, it's not just about the ethics of how they use or the ethics of how they work, it's all the ethics of the people who had to be involved in making it work in the way that it does. So, thank you for bearing with me. I'm going to conclude. Um, <coughs> for me, the reality is that the people who have been involved in developing AI tools for education have done an amazing job. Right? They're really clever people, and they've really worked hard, and they've, they've found all sorts of amazing things. So, my metaphor is they've climbed this mountain. But the problem is that what they've developed has all the problems that I've identified today. And what they miss is the bigger mountain in the background. And what they miss is the opportunities that this technology brings. So we need the technologies. They're here, right? They're not going away. The genie's out the bottle. But we need to turn these technologies so they're actually doing things that we believe are important to help us innovate teaching and learning while respecting human rights, while ensuring that students maintain agency and autonomy, while ensuring that teachers are not disempowered. And if we don't do that, then we have a real problem. So, in summary, I'm not completely against AI. I'm not completely against AI in ed. I'm not completely against generative AI. But I really think we need to take a step and think very carefully about this. <clears throat> and to those of us who are involved in education, we need to shout loudly and make sure people understand the different issues that we've talked about today so that in the future we can ensure that the development and the use of these tools are generally for the common good of all of our students, all of our educators and society at large. So, oh, I forgot I was going to do this. Okay, so I'm going to leave you with some questions for HE. I'm sorry. Yeah, anyway, these are some questions that I think any of you, you know, involved in HE should really be thinking about. So, ethics, bias, and fairness, equity and accessibility, privacy and data security, teaching and learning. What do we tell our students? Um, knowledge and skills, employment, over-reliance. So there's a whole range of things that we need to be thinking about. And if we don't, then these tools are going to segue their way into the world and you know, do all sorts of um, terrible things. So that's it. So thank you very much for listening. Bueno, tenemos un poco de tiempo para preguntas. No sé si alguien quiera. Thank you. Uh, 
Well, um, in, in a past slide when you uh, asked ChatGPT about uh, the different impacts in education, there was one that is uh, passive learning. And it rings a bell to me because I think we are too passive with these technologies and with this uh, way of approaching uh, artificial intelligence. But it's not only the learning, but the activities that we do are passive. Uh, we were talking with a friend that I made here earlier that she uh, remembered when she was six years old, uh, probably 10 numbers to call the family. And now she doesn't know a, a number by, by a heart. The same for me, I don't know many things. Sometimes I need to Google everything to remember. So I'm losing my capability to, to uh, retain information and, and even to uh, relate some things. I, I always need to go to my notes and everything. So as humanity, I think we are losing some abilities. Um, how, in your experience, we can uh, challenge ourselves as humans, not in a technological way, but as a human side, uh, to be more active, to be more critical, to be more uh, uh, <laughs> challenging with uh, the models that we are living, and especially in education. I have a five-year-old nephew and I, every time I saw him, it's like, what's going to happen with him? Because right now, I try to impulse uh, his curiosity and his ability to know more things. But at some point, he's going to be on his own. And I'm afraid that the next generations, not our generations, but the next ones, will lose these abilities. So what, what, is, what is your approach and your, your think, thoughts about this? I, it's a really good but really difficult question to yeah. answer. I think, you know, um, <coughs> taking personal responsibility, I think what we have to understand, this is getting bigger, um, we live within a culture, right? We live within a society, we live with certain governance and certain priorities. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, we have technologies that are really cool. You know, I have my iPhone, I love my sat-nav, I love being able to, you know, check things on, on, um, on I'm going to say Twitter, on former Twitter. You know, I like to be able to do that stuff. So I like my technologies, right? Um, but it's about how do we make sure that we're using those technologies to support us as humans, as you were saying. And that's really challenging. But it probably starts partly um, at school. And so that's why those of us who are educators in schools, um, there's that opportunity. But I think it's... it's um, it's taken that, um, that social perspective. It's about trying to understand that we want um, young people to be the best that they can be, to self-actualize, and we need to do that. But it's really hard to do when we're in the umbrella, the organizations, the world that we live in. So getting that balance um, is really, really challenging. So all I can say is keep going and let's, let's hope. Thank you. Um, hi, I, with, um, with the machines now passing Turing tests, many of these technologies, not only ChatGPT in certain senses, just uh, passing Turing tests, and, and I agree with you, they are not intelligent. Uh, they are very good at digesting information, correlating things, and their pattern recognition might be good, but they are not intelligent. But with the uh, new uh, deep learning and uh, neural networks, algorithms, and uh, you know there is a variety of them. How long do you think these machines will be considered intelligent and being able to surpass human beings in certain tasks? Because as of today, they are much better and much more efficient at doing certain, uh, certain tasks uh, than human beings, but they are you know, like very automated tasks. <laughs> Uh, they will evolve, I think, eventually to really kind of think for themselves. But there is one caveat here. If you strip them out of feelings and emotions, because I think that is going to take a long, long time. But as far as efficiency in terms of uh, doing some things that humans uh, take a long time to learn and a long time to, uh, to, to, to master, they can master in seconds. So 
H how long do you think it's going to take to convert on those technologies? Uh, it, <laughs> it's difficult to answer such a question, but I will give you my answer, and my answer is simply, not in my lifetime. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And, you know, you pointed out at the beginning that um, ChatGPT can pass the Turing test. Well, that just shows us the Turing test doesn't really test anything. The Turing test is about, can we fool something? That doesn't tell you about intelligence. Intelligence is not about fooling. It's about far more complex things than that. So I just don't think, I think, you know, the way that these generative AI work is they predict. They predict the best next word, the best next word, the best next word. What's that got to do with intelligence? It just correlates it to what is in the data that they have been trained on. Does this sentence appear in the data next to that sentence? Yes, it does. Okay, I'll display it. That's not intelligent. It looks intelligent, but it really isn't intelligent. And I think that's the thing. That's the message that I, you know, when we talk about gender value, that's the one message to get across. That yes, they do. I mean, an image I think I might add to future presentations is of a magician. Right? I mean, pulling a, a rabbit out of a hat. Now, when a magician works, we know it's not really magic, but my God, it looks magical. Right? And I think that's what generative AI is. We know in our hearts it's not intelligent, but it really does look that way. And I think it's that, that distance. So we, you know, those of us who work with students and students in the room, you know, um, the problem is that because it looks so good, people are willing to trust it. That, for me, is a huge problem. I'm very happy for my students to use it so long as they take a really strong, critical view of what it generates and then they use other sources to check it in different ways. I was at a, um, a presentation, the, the red book there. So um, a guy, uh, a professor, um, was um, really into using this technology and he asked in the presentation for ChatGPT to suggest a book on AI in education. And I was so chuffed because it came up with artificial intelligence in education, promising implications for teaching and learning, right? My book. What I was a bit annoyed about was it credited it to other people. <laughs> That's not intelligence. So, uh, basically, uh, the main issues that are brought about by mainstream media about AI is basically the fear that it's going to destroy us. In the sense that it's going to become more intelligent than us, than us and it's going to take us over. But I believe that, in my opinion, that the true fear many people are having about AI is that it's, since it isn't intelligent yet, and it probably won't be in, in a while, is the intentions of the people who use it to, if we have had problems already about election meddling, about fake news, about a deep faking politician giving speeches that, that, that they never gave, about um, racism, about in inclusion, uh, and those are problems about AI that aren't talked about because AI can be used to create all kinds of manipulative intentions and, inip and manipulative um, information that it's not true and it's not easy to, to, to disprove like on a superficial level. So what are your thoughts about uh, the problems of AI regarding inclusivity and especially fairness and ethical use in elections and in politics and in worldviews in general? Sorry yeah. to interrupt, just one more question. I think if you can take it, and the last question, and, that, and then we have to proceed to the... Okay. To the I can answer this one, yes? Well, I, I'll quickly answer this because I, I, I completely agree with you. I think this is, the, this is the problem we have at the moment, is the things that the AI systems are doing, all the issues you raised, right? That is fundamentally important. But again, as you also hinted, it's not the AI that's doing this. It's the people who are running it that are doing this. And that's what we need to be really, really careful about. And um, so people... Um, they hide behind it. Oh, it's the AI. It's nothing to do with us. See? It's just nonsense, right? It's all of these things that these companies do. And again, we saw some earlier today. It's about how those technologies work and who is pointing them in which directs them and asking what questions and which times we use it and which we don't. And as you say, things like elections. You know, as you know, I come from the UK 
and we're suffering, suffering really badly from Brexit. And Brexit was definitely, AI was involved in that. Russian-backed AI. So I completely agree. Thanks, great conference. I was uh, uh, looking at the green uh, book, and I thought if you were a congressman, not in Mexico, but a congressman in charge of education uh, laws related to AI, what would, be, what would your recommendations to start to implement AI tools in higher education? I think that the first thing is we must have robust, independent evidence at scale that the tools actually work and are safe. And if we don't have that, then we shouldn't be using them in higher education, in my opinion, because they potentially can be very, very dangerous of all the you know, many reasons I've mentioned. Um, so, yeah, that's how I would do it. We need to have that. And I mentioned the work I'm doing at the Council of Europe, which obviously, you know, is not connected with Mexico. Um, but um, if we get the regulation right there, then at least hopefully it will be a beacon that other people can look at and, and hopefully um, it will be useful to them. Because I think we have to do that before these technologies are allowed in classrooms. What, you know, I, it just, I can't fathom, understand why we allow these technologies with no evidence that they do anything, with no evidence that they're safe in the classrooms. So that, that, that's what I would do. We need to have that in the first place, in my opinion. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Eh, le vamos a entregar un, un regalo por parte de, de la universidad. Los invitamos a dar un aplauso al profesor. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Y a continuación tenemos el taller con el profesor Holmes. Los que se van a quedar al taller pueden quedarse aquí. Los que no.